Hello everybody and welcome to Toy 2 to You Curator's Corner, episode number 29. My name's Sean Brosnan, I'm a curator at Toy 2 Otago Settlers Museum, telling stories about Pioneer Dunedin. Now in the last episode, I presented a very positive perspective on bicultural beginnings in Otago in looking at the achievements and personality of Tame Parata of Pukitaraki, who I called a bicultural pioneer. But it would be remiss of me to leave the story there and imply that it was all sweetness and light when it came to bicultural relations in Pioneer Otago. There was, of course, another side to the story, one of loss, of marginalisation, of exclusion on behalf of the original people of the place, the Takata Whenua. Now, the settlers might have said that it was always going to be that way, that inevitably their dominant economic and technological base was going to push aside the native inhabitants with their traditional way of living off the land, simply incompatible with the mass large-scale farming of the same place by the newcomers. Eh, maybe that was true, but there could have been other ways of doing things that left room for the old alongside the new. Ways for two cultures to coexist. Well, today I want to share one incident from a pioneer account that suggests a failure of imagination on the part of the pioneer Scots as one reason why such an inclusive bicultural society did not develop from the very get-go. This comes from the memoir of John Maclay, another pioneer child who wrote in old age of his formative years as a boy in early Dunedin. Now I'm going to draw on Maclay's memoirs again in future episodes, uh, but today I just want to cherry pick a couple of accounts he gives of the Maori presence in Pioneer Dunedin. The first relates to something I referred to in an early episode, which is the importance of food supplied by Maori for the pioneers in the first years of settlement. John McClay, for instance, describes his family as virtually surviving off ship's biscuits and the potatoes and fish that they bought off Maori when supplies were scarce in Dunedin. And he describes the way in which Maori boats brought those fish to the settlement. These boats came from a long way along the coast, Otago Heads, Waikawaiti and Moiraki, north and south from the Tairi Mouth, making over 40 miles. And when they got up the river, as the estuary is mostly called today, he means the harbour, when the Maori boats got up at high tides, they sailed their boats into a big creek that came down along the foot of the big hill on the left side of Rattray Street. When they got into this creek and got the fish unloaded onto mats, they pulled the boats up onto a nice dry gravel beach. They turned the boat's bottoms up and then all put all their mats under and other things, their blankets and fish, away from the sun. Men, women and children also, slept under their boats. You could buy four of the barracuda for a shilling, three foot long and more. Harpuka is a thick, fine, heavy fish weighing from 20 to 40 pounds. You could buy one for one and sixpence, and often for less. Maclay also describes a Maori camp that existed in the early 1850s at the bottom of the Rattray Street Hill, by the Toitu Stream. I think it was approximately where the warehouse building is, actually, in an area that Maclay tells us was then thickly covered in flax, toy toy, scrub and fern. And it was also used by the Maori labourers employed by Charles Kettle for a survey party between 1846 and 48. Maclay describes the Maori huts as in the shape of a beehive, which tells us they were examples of whariro, roundhouses, that were the standard temporary shelters of Kaitahu on such food gathering round locations. We have a replica of one in our Ara Ita Uru display at Toitu. And you can see another group of them in this painting by Carolyn Valpi of the South Dunedin Flat in 1849. The Toitu mural on the wall of the Crown Hotel in Rattray Street also includes such houses. Now they've taken artistic license to put them in the mural at a spot that must be Princes Street, Though ironically, it was actually just across the road from the mural that's hut, that such huts would actually have been seen. Now this camp in Rattray Street, a Maori toehold in the Pioneer Settlement, didn't persist, and you might wonder why not. Did it become redundant with the construction of the Maori hostelry in Princes Street, which I described in episode 11? Well, that wasn't until 1859, so that's too late to account for it. Maclay's reminiscence may provide the answer. He lived on Rattray Street at this time and probably passed by the camp en route to school. And here's what he tells us. 
When we got near the Maori camp, us boys and girls were terrible afraid of the wild Maoris dancing their war dances. It was terrible to see the frightful faces they made as they danced, leapt and jumped about with fierce, blood-curdling yells. We trembled with fear. There was a row of men on one side, and 20 foot away from the men was a row of women that these men seemed to be quarrelling about, with long spears in their hands. These poor women were supposed to be taken in some of their tribal fights. All the people about here was very much afraid of them. After a lot of complaints, the superintendent, Captain Cargill, and the Reverend Dr Burns, and the magistrate, Mr Strode, got them to shift down to Otago Heads, and all was very pleased they had left forever this place. Now, I haven't been able to find any other reference to corroborate the story of Murray being moved on from the Rattray Street camp on account of their wild harker performances. And it seems a bit of a shame, and really a failure of the imagination on the cultural front by the Scottish pioneers, if this was true. And that started at the very top, as we can see from this caustic comment made by the uh, Muraki chief, Matia Hatira Moruhu, in 1856. We have not been pleased with Captain Cargill, with MacAndrew's set, with all the men of Scotland. Though seven years have passed, they do not know anything of us. Nothing at all of the Maori from Murihiku to Waitaki. Well, I'm sure there's more that could be said about bicultural relations in Otago, and perhaps we will in future episodes. But for now, there's a little story of the haka at the Rattray Street Camp and the moving on of Maori from Pioneer Dunedin.